There are many unscrupulous people who try to say that because the Bible is perhaps wrong about some historical um, events, or perhaps it was literally trying to say that the, um, the sun uh, revolves around the earth instead of vice versa, that we can then throw everything out, which is absolute insanity, you know? That's like saying, well, the Persians and the Babylonians never existed because the Bible is wrong about the earth and the sun. You know, just absolute madness. Abs or the Romans didn't exist. Just absolute madness. Absolute madness. You know? So even if the Bible is to take be taken literally, you know, we it's much more logical to say that, hey, it's a book like any other book, a historical document, perhaps, is one way to look at it. And just like every other historical document, there's some errors and some truths, and it's very logical which things couldn't possibly be um, errors, and the morality couldn't possibly have any errors in it. Um, so those of us who are intelligent, we know. You know, and me personally, I take it as stories with a moral, and that there is a God, and that He's trying to relay the information to you about how to live a righteous life in a very profound story. And to miss that point is to um, not connect to the Creator. Spirituality is really about cr connecting to the Creator. Everything else is some kind of a joke, some kind of a, a psychological gimmick. So anyway, Revelations 14, 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, fornication comes in many forms. You know, if I say, for example, you know, for me not to give to the poor is like me bashing the poor in the fucking head, you know, with a, with a, with a club. Can one then say, well, he's talking about the importance of giving to the poor. You know, he, he's not really saying that bashing people in the head with a club is wrong. <laughs> no, motherfucker. It was compared to that because it is dead wrong and it is a blatant example. Just like fornication is a very obvious, straightforward example of evil. Anyway, and it's, it's very sad. You're going to have bootlickers, homosexuals, feminists twisting even something as apparent as that. Just absolutely detestable. So anyway... Going on to Revelation 17, and I'm going to connect these two together. And the woman who was arrayed, excuse me, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So, again, going back to the last scripture where I said, you know, the, you know, the obvious example, okay? They said it's full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Okay, so this person, another way to look at it, they have all these riches, but they got them from doing abominations and fornications, such as women using their pussy power to get the things that they wouldn't otherwise have, you know, or blood money or anything else that's, you know, deplorable and repulsive that people gain from immoral behavior. And he says, this is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So this is, this is the root of the philosophy of women who live a harlot life and people who spiritually prostitute themselves and other forms of abominations that are to be found of this world, on this world. Okay? 
I mean, I don't see how you could possibly disagree. Just today I talked to somebody who was like, oh, I got to look into it for myself. What, what the, and, they, and they don't want to hear scripture, but they got to look into them for themselves. They're not going to look into it. They're going to fall short of glory. It's like Hosea, I think it was 8-6. I'll look that up at the end. It starts off by saying the people perish for lack of knowledge, something along these lines. Okay. If you don't know this. If you don't seek the kingdom of heaven and learn to identify the wolves in sheep's clothes and the vipers, well, guess what? You're probably hanging out with wolves and vipers thinking that you're fine, but you're not. Going down to 18, again, this is Revelation 17. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. There and again, the woman is the root of the philosophy. It reigns, the principality, it reigns over the kings of the earth. Spread this philosophy, kings of the earth. And as a result, the kings push the social norms of Babylon. It is a Babylonian system which is centered with the woman, with the whore that rode the beast, the woman arrayed in purple and scarlet. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, some people once said to me, if you found, find something more than once in the Bible, then it's true. Using this scale. Remember, the Bible is constantly saying to you there's a right way to live your life, there's a wrong way. And they're saying it in different ways, and they're using different historical events to get this idea across. So in 1 Kings 26 through, well, I go on with this one, through 46... Then I'm going to go to 1 Kings 19. Um, looks like 1 through 2. No, no, 1 through 5. And then I'm going to go down to 17 through 18. Okay. So, so they took the bowl given them... See if I got this on the screen. I can't read this word because I had to fill in that uh, part. Uh, see, it's 26. My first thing, 1826. Okay, yeah, I got it on the screen, luckily. And prepared it. So they took the bowl given them and prepared. They took the bowl given to them and prepared. 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. Now, this is the funny part. You have people in secret societies who worship Baal. They think they know the Bible better than Christians and that they've come to a superior perspective that Lucifer wasn't treated fairly and so on and so forth. There's people who take this literally. There's people who are atheistic Satanists and they're both wrong. And I'm about to just completely destroy both their points of view. Of course, they're not going to be honorable enough to admit it because part of their philosophy is to be a self-deluded, fucking out-of-touch imbecile. So... Um, so he says, surely he's a God, perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. He's taunting them, you know? So those of you say, well, why do you, why do you speak to these people this way? Aren't you taunting them? Aren't you talking bad to them? Yes. If it was good enough for Elijah, who Jesus referenced himself, then it's good enough for me. Surely. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Why? Because they're a bunch of magic card bitches, and they don't know what the fuck they're talking about, literally or otherwise. You know, when it comes to what, they talk, what they're talking about. <clears throat> 
Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seed of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars of water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that, in Israel, and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord filled and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had brought had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And Elisha said to Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew back with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain started falling, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now this is 1 Kings 19. Now Ahab told Jeze Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and fell asleep. The Lord basically awakens him. The angels awaken him. They feed him and so on. Going down to 17. Jehu will put to death any who escape. Okay, and God tells him to, you know, to make, to anoint certain kings of Israel and so on. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Now, for those of you who kiss ass to the New World Order scum, who have made statues to Baal and Molech, think about it. Molech, or Moloch, Malcolm, and so on, they have different names, is symbolized by the bull. And you can symbolize the scene of Baal worship. Moloch and Baal are very much so connected by the sacrifice of the bull, or the bull prepared by the prophets, the quote-unquote prophets of um, um, Balaam, of Baal. Now, I'm out of time now. To make a long story short, God preserved, God saved, spared the 7,000 Israels who were true and the ones who sold out to the what would become the New World Order philosophy you know, weren't spared. Several times in the Bible, I prove my point. Thank you.